is happening there. What we know is that, as a matter of geometry, the group of events in question are arranged about a centre. Now we find not only that one light wave travels outward from a centre, according to a certain law, but also that, in general, it is followed by other closely similar light waves. The sun, for example, does not change its appearance suddenly. If a cloud passes across it during a high wind, the transition is gradual, though swift. In this way, a group of occurrences connected with a centre at one point of space-time is brought into relation with other very similar groups whose centres are at neighbouring points of space-time. If we are to avoid unnecessary hypotheses, we shall say that an atom at a given moment is the various disturbances in the surrounding medium, which in ordinary language will be said to be caused by it. But we shall not take these disturbances at what is for us the moment in question, since that would make them depend upon the observer. We shall instead travel outward from the atom with the velocity of light and take the disturbance we find in each place as we reach it. The closely similar set of disturbances with very nearly the same centre, which is found existing slightly earlier or slightly later, will be defined as being the atom at a slightly earlier or slightly later moment. In this way, we preserve all the laws of physics without having recourse to unnecessary hypotheses or inferred entities, and we remain in harmony with the general principle of economy, which has enabled the theory of relativity to clear away so much useless lumber. Common sense imagines that when it sees a table, it sees a table. This is a delusion. When common sense sees a table, certain light waves reach its eyes, and these are of a sort which, in its previous experience, has been associated with certain sensations of touch, as well as with other people's testimony that they also saw the table. But none of this ever brought us to the table itself. The light waves caused occurrences in our eyes. And these caused occurrences in the optic nerve, and these in turn caused occurrences in the brain. Any one of these, happening without the usual preliminaries, would have caused us to have the sensations we call seeing the table, even if there had been no table. When we say that a person sees a table, we use a highly abbreviated form of expression, concealing complicated and difficult inferences, the validity of which may well be open to question. Everything that occurs elsewhere, owing to the existence of an atom, can be explored experimentally, at least in theory, unless it occurs in certain concealed ways. An atom is known by its effects, but the word effects belongs to a view of causation which will not fit modern physics, and in particular will not fit relativity. All that we have a right to say is that certain groups of occurrences happen together, that is to say, in neighbouring parts of space-time. It seems very clear that all the facts and laws of physics can be interpreted without assuming that matter is anything more than groups of events, each event being of the sort which we should naturally regard as caused by the matter in question. This does not involve any change in the symbols or formulae of physics, it is merely a question of interpretation of the symbols. This latitude in interpretation is a characteristic of mathematical physics. What we know is certain very abstract logical relations, which we express in mathematical formulae. We know also that at certain points we arrive at results which are capable of being tested experimentally. Take, for example, the astronomical observations by which the predictions of relativity theory as to the behaviour of light were confirmed. The formulae, which were to be verified, were concerned with the course of light in interplanetary space. Although the part of these formulae which gives the observed result must always be interpreted in the same way, the other part of them may be capable of a great variety of interpretations. The formulae giving the motions of the planets are almost exactly the same in Einstein's theory as in Newton's, but the meaning of the formulae is quite different. It may be said generally that in the mathematical treatment of nature we can be far more certain that our formulae are approximately correct 
than we can be as to the correctness of this or that interpretation of them. And so the question as to the nature of an electron or a proton is by no means answered when we know all that mathematical physics has to say about the laws of its motion and the laws of its interaction with the environment. A definite and conclusive answer to our question is not possible because a variety of answers are compatible with the truth of mathematical physics. That may seem astounding, but the philosophical consequences of relativity are neither so great nor so startling as is sometimes thought. The theory throws very little light on time-honoured controversies, such as that between realism, that is, things have a real absolute existence, and idealism, things are subjective. Some people think relativity supports Kant's view that space and time are subjective. I think such people have been misled by the way in which writers on relativity speak of the observer. It is natural to suppose that the observer is a human being, or at least a mind. But it is just as likely to be a photographic plate or a clock. The subjectivity concerned in the theory of relativity is a physical subjectivity, which would exist equally if there were no such things as minds or senses in the world. Moreover, it is a strictly limited subjectivity. The theory does not say that everything is relative. On the contrary, it gives a technique for distinguishing what is relative from what belongs to a physical occurrence in its own right. If we are going to say that the theory supports Kant about space and time, we shall have to say that it refutes him about space-time. One thing which does emerge is that physics tells us much less about the physical world than we thought it did. Almost all the great principles of traditional physics turn out to be like the great law that there are always a hundred centimetres in a metre. Others turn out to be downright false. The conservation of mass may serve to illustrate both these misfortunes to which a law is liable. Mass used to be defined as quantity of matter, and as far as experiment showed, it was never increased or diminished. But with the greater accuracy of modern measurements, the mass was found to increase with the velocity. This kind of mass was found to be really the same thing as energy. This kind of mass is not constant for a given body. The law itself is a truism. It results from our methods of measurement and does not express a genuine property of matter. The other kind of mass, which we may call proper mass, is that which is found to be the mass by an observer moving with the body. The proper mass of a body is very nearly constant, but not quite. One would suppose that if you have four kilogram weights and you put them all together into the scales, they will together weigh four kilograms. This is a fond illusion. They weigh less, though not enough less to be discovered by even the most careful measurements. Go down to the atomic scale, however, and as we noted, when four hydrogen atoms are put together to make one helium atom, the defect is noticeable. The helium atom weighs measurably less than four separate hydrogen atoms. The world which the theory of relativity presents to our imagination is not so much a world of things in motion as a world of events. It is true that there are still particles which seem to persist, but these are really to be conceived as strings of connected events, like the successive notes of a song. It is events that are the stuff of relativity physics. Between two events which are not too remote from each other, there is, in the general theory, a 